Okay, uh, hi everybody. Um, we're going to do a little discussion on uh, virtual production training and where it, where it is and where it needs to go next. Um, it's a huge challenge in the industry right now um, and we need to figure out where it's going to improve and how it's going to improve. So uh, I'm Mike Grieve, I'm Commercial Director of Moses, um, a manufacturer of virtual production equipment based in London. To my left, I have Alex Boutelier, who is a senior lecturer in cinematography at Ravensbourne, um, actually next door to us, uh, interestingly. Mm -hmm. I've got David Levy, um, friend, colleague, industry extraordinaire. Um, basically, David's from ARRI, and it was him and colleagues who set up the Uxbridge ARRI stage um, and got that off the ground. And that's going particularly well uh, at the moment, which is great. And at the end, I've got my colleague, um, Dom, Smith, I must remember his family name, and Dom <laughs> runs uh, or is part of the Moses Academy. And the Moses Academy was Moses's reaction to, okay, so we know there's a problem with training and trained personnel operators. What are we going to do about it? So we started the Academy and flattery is everything. It's good to see lots of other companies copying us and doing the same thing. And actually, it's, it's really good. It's going to help. Um, so you've got really the whole spectrum here. You've got the manufacturer, the University is training the next generation of people. You've got the uh, another manufacturer, but an operator and, and uh, um, a, a runner of a virtual production space, one of the biggest in the in the UK. And then you've got um, the academy uh, trainers who are actually training both existing professionals who need to transform into virtual production and actually taking university graduates and then taking them on to the next stage, giving them the onset experience. Because one of the problems with university students, I'm sure we're going to hear, is they come out and then they want to get on set, but they haven't got the onset experience. They don't get picked up by the production company. So we try and bridge that gap. Um, so I want to introduce you and talk about um, different experiences. So let's start with um, Alex. So tell us, Alex, about what you're doing with your university graduates, final year students, to prepare them to come in the industry and actually help us solve this problem collectively. Um, as you pointed out, we're literally across from you guys in, yeah. in, in Greenwich, and, and that sort of lends itself to a collaboration. And we have both film and TV production departments. And there's a great interest uh, from, from both sides to get involved in virtual production. And we also have game design and animation. So there was right from the beginning uh, an opportunity to combine sort of across departments all these different disciplines, get the game design students to become interested in the Unreal Engine and at the same time get the film students to become interested in the idea of using some kind of virtual production yep. setup. So we initially started with a green screen. That was before um, Moses came on board and gave us their equipment to use for a certain period of time. Uh, so we've, I've been trying to build it and, and I can see that there's a great interest. We actually lost some students to game design who originally started out in film yeah. but really went into Unreal. And so um, my challenge is bringing all these different aspects of virtual yep. production together. So the traditional filmmaking side, traditional cinematography, plus this new extended element of the, you know, not just the virtual on set, but then the creation of the assets yep. in Unreal Engine. Yeah, yeah. that's that's good. And, and you, you know, you are one of a number of universities around the UK that are investing in this technology, uh, A, because there's a demand for it from the student side, but B, the industry is saying that they want these courses to be taught and to generate the, the, the future operators. Um, so David, you've, you've had a wonderful experience the last few years, I know, uh, building that volume, and, and I know how much you were involved in it with, um, with colleagues there to get it off the ground and you know, persuading Ari Munich to do anything is not as straightforward as it may seem, but it worked. Um, what are your experiences now with um, production companies coming in um, in terms of their knowledge and, and what you guys have to do to make sure they have a good experience? Well, we're educating the production houses, yeah. the VFX houses, the producers, the directors, the DOPs, and it's not always that straightforward. Um, but ARI has a really long history of, we, we have an academy program, we do a lot of educational incentives for the universities to make it affordable for them to, you know, invest in our products and uh, pass on that training to the students. But it's, it's something we've always done at ARI. I mean, from 
the transition from analog to digital yeah. cinema cameras. We did a lot of hand-holding then, mm -hmm. and it's the sort of same journey we're going through now. We've gone analog to digital to now virtual, and the virtualization of our products, the virtualization of workflow, we're going from a very what was a very linear production method yeah. to something that's very non-linear, yeah. and thankfully, you know, this industry is tying in support from the gaming industry, from the live events industry, broadcast, yeah. and the film and television. And together, all of us together, we're having to do a lot of, you know, further education, further development, which is, you know, I think a really good and positive thing, especially yeah. for the industry. Yeah, it is. And so, Dom, you, you know, we most have set up this academy, what was it, about a year ago, um, yeah. in, in direct response to people saying, we need more education, we need that on-set experience and and the courses that uh, Dom and the crew run uh, both here in LA are, are actually on set it's not a terminal where you're learning Unreal Engine it's using cameras it's calibrating LED volumes it's getting tracking systems sorted out so it's really hands-on um, but to, talk to us Dom about the sort of range of people we've had because it isn't just students is it it's quite surprising who's actually signed up for the yeah, course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we see people from all sorts of backgrounds and industries, you know, from very technical people to creatives. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody seems to want a piece of virtual production at the minute, and that's brilliant. And um, we just want to help people be able to achieve that. And that starts at understanding what virtual production actually is and how to go about starting their journey in VP. So, you know, we get uh, lots of people from education, uh, you know, some of Alex's colleagues have been through the course, yep. as well as other universities that we've worked with. Um, you know, we get people from broadcast who yep. are training their technicians to be able to deal with this, um, you know, out on, on the road. Um, and, you know, we have independent filmmakers and, you know, film students, people like that who yep. you know, want to see what these tools can do for them creatively as well. So yeah. it's a real mix. But uh, you know, that's great for us. It's good. And, and then seeing now the other manufacturers coming on board and then offering their uh, academies is fantastic. So I think collectively we will, we will begin to address this. But there are certain things that you know, virtual production requires. So I've been, I'm old enough to have been around when it first started, uh, mid-90s, and it was a broadcast-only um, technology. Great big, huge silicon graphic machines per camera. Um, and the graphics didn't really look that, that good. They were OK. Um, to where we are now, where in the not too distant future, we won't be using the word virtual production. It'll just be production. It will be a standard way of doing, uh, creating content because it does have significant advantages. And, uh, you know, the LED walls that came in on the back of the Mandalorian, which was what released in late 2019, has seen this huge growth of um, these volumes. But virtual production doesn't need an LED wall. Um, it encompasses all sorts of different um, flavors. And, and one of the key things I think is that we, you know, we recognize that it's not just about LED. I know David's got one, but uh, it's about green, blue, black. It's about AR, it's about mixed reality. Um, and that's what we are trying to teach something on the, the academy, yeah, aren't we, the, the cross yeah. range. Um, and there are some pros and cons of using different technologies. So we've been using, you know, green screen and broadcast for what, 40 plus years, and in uh, digital film for probably about 30. Um, and, and there are some really good things about those technologies. So they definitely are not going to go anywhere. But some really great things about LED. So talk to us, um, David, about why, why would I use your volume as opposed to going into a traditional green screen or blue screen studio? What do I get extra? Well, the, the design of our studio was really focused around highly reflective objects. So car process work is what the, the, the current design of the stage is built around. But also um, convincing performances. What we found with the, the talent and uh, key artists in this space, they really respond very well to be able to visually see yeah. the environment. I mean, it's a completely enclosed 360 degree volume. It is good at doing some things, but other things it's not very good at. So yeah. in the case of um, not having final assets, photorealistic environments available, well, then you probably shouldn't do it. In the case where we don't have the complete um, final asset available, we, we put a green thrustum up yep. behind mm -hmm. where the camera is pointing. We still use the rest of the volume for environmental lighting and yep. high resolution reflections. But, and honestly, you could probably, unless there is a, a real reason for it, yep. It's a very expensive, quite high risk thing to do. Mm. Um, and that's why I also still really recommend strongly green screen production because 
it's low risk, but you're still incorporating a lot of the workflow and technology and the real-time compositing techniques that you would use yeah. as part of a virtual production tool set. Yeah, yeah. And we're talking about you know, where, where training's going. So he, he brings up a really good point, which is you know, you've got a film to make or, or a TV show. There are some shots that will work really well in LED volume, some that will work better in green screen, and actually some that will work well on location. Um, and it's kind of knowing from a production point of view, when you use which technology for which shot. But there are even um, concepts of using both LED and green screen in the same studio with the same tracking environment. So you can actually switch the cameras around. So green for your opening wide shot, and then LED for close up or you know top um, torso or, or um, reflective shots. So that has to be taught as well. So the, the training that we need to do going forwards has to encompass everything we know about virtual production today and all the different screen technologies, plus the new techniques that are coming in. Uh, and there's even one now, I mean, we've got a product that will re-render scenes as you're shooting them, okay? Because there is this challenge in virtual production, whichever method you use or whichever um, flavor, is that you have to balance the photorealism, which is checking lots of polygons to make it look really realistic and path tracing and ray tracing to make it look absolutely real with can that actually play back in real time? Because if it can't, you can't shoot in camera visual effects. And this actually affects every single production. There's a process that happens called um, optimization. It, it really is taking stuff out the scene to make sure it plays back okay. So these are all the techniques that we, you know, we collectively all need to teach both at the university level, at the you know, post-university, and then actually training production companies when they come in initially to talk about their productions, you know, what they can do and how they should do it. So at Ravenswell, I actually went there, um, not for the full three year, but for the mm -hmm. two year, uh, two week short course, brilliant university. Um, do you, how do you value your relationships with uh, manufacturers? I mean, is that a big part of trying to create that realistic environment for the students? So when they come out, it's not this huge shock that they're used to, you know, working in a in a, in a manufacturing environment, for example? Well, there's, this, I mean, anyone who's been to film school or, you know, TV school knows that sometimes there's a bit of a disconnect as to this is what the industry is doing, this is what we're training them, and sometimes it's 20 years out of date. Yeah. So when I took over a unit that was called Emerging Film Technologies, yeah. uh, because I had a personal interest in uh, virtual production, um, I felt that, you know, I, I went to Moses and I called up I think Dimension Studio, a few other people. Uh, I talked to Ari uh, to see like, look, where's this going? What do you need from our students? And they're very clear about, look, we need kids who are not just into video games yeah. and come from the game design world. We need to know, they need to know about lenses, composition, yeah. focal length, lighting. Uh, so that really helped me sort of shape what we're trying to teach. Yep. I'd say trying to teach in that you know, I'm not the money guy. Whatever yeah. they allow me to teach, I'll, yeah. I'll try to squeeze <laughs> yeah. in. And, um, and again, any chance we get to bring them to Moses and, and do anything hands-on or show them, look, this is how, this is what's happening yep. right now. Could you fit in there? Um, I'll take that chance. We went to Ari, Uxbridge. We looked at the, um, they showed us, the, you know, the stage and all that, which is really impressive. And the students got to talk to you guys and... Um, you know, it, it changes everything when you feel like, oh, wow, there's an actual opening. It's actually quite strange because there's a real opening now for young people. Because yep. at my age, I find it a lot harder. <laughs> my, my brain's no longer like a sponge. Yeah, got it's, the quite, it's quite full, right? <laughs> but, you know, when you're in your 20s or, you know, even yeah. a bit younger sometimes, they can really get into yep, this, right? Can. And that there is demand for, can. you know, that kind of yeah. um, skill set. So, so one, one side is the, is the operators and the creators of the future, but the other side is taking production company executives who are used to doing regular on-set shoots or location shoots and selling them the advantages of using virtual production because they are, I mean, quite formidable. And I think that's the other problem that we have is we could train all the operators in the colleges and the unis and the, you know, the um, academies, but we need then the production companies to understand how and why they should be using virtual production. A good example is, I mean, we're involved in some very big bids and actually one of the most important parts that each of these particular um, projects uh, looks at is what's the education side? I know you can provide all the equipment and set it all up and train, but how am I going to train my people to use that kit? So the human aspect is really important. I mean, do you, do you find that with the production people who come in that you're 
you're having to sort of train them and their crew and people behind them on, on what to do and where the benefits are. Yeah, we need to. I mean, there are some who are resistant to it and some who are really open to it, but it, I mean, in our environment, it's very much a single camera drama yep. and, it's, and it's, it starts at the script. It's looking at the script and going, okay, which of these is really for virtual production? Which of these are for location? Which is this? Yep. Is a set build or traditional? And it's, it's sitting and working and yeah. going along the process together yeah. um, and not just expecting people to know. I mean, there's a lot of half knowledge out there, especially when it comes to virtual production. They see it behind the scenes. They watch a, you know, a small tutorial on the subject and everybody's an expert, but there are things that you need to learn as part of the process. Yeah. I mean, what we found after two years of being involved in this process is the forums no longer give you the information you're looking for and you're sort of contributing to the forums on a daily basis and yeah. you know trying to disseminate as much information out there as possible yeah. but in a in a way which can actually be understood and absorbed yeah. by a, a larger group of people which can be quite difficult to yeah. do but again we you know we're in this for the long haul we yeah. we, we, we want to carry on being relevant and innovative in our industry and you know, it's a big point of pride for us at Ari to, to be part of the community, to yeah. be part of that storytelling process and, yeah. and you know, to support and develop yeah. the industry further. Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of um, misinformation about virtual production. There was this huge uh, impact the Mandalorian had on, on people, certainly going after LED volumes. There are lots of cases we're aware of where we've had production companies, individuals go out and buy a, a LED wall and then wonder why it doesn't work or you know buy a wall with the wrong processor and and they haven't got the tracking sorted out there are there are lots of examples of this where people just didn't understand what was going on there so so we we've had to basically go back and re-educate people and say if you want to do this kind of production this is the kit you need and these are the techniques you need to learn and actually you know make sure that that happens and it actually is impacting our business now where they want the operators in place before they actually move ahead with the production, because how would they do it, right? How would they actually get this thing off the ground? So, Don, what, what uh, I mean, we've recently added into the academy, obviously all about LED walls and yep. so on. Um, are you hearing of any other elements that we need to add into the courses to, you know, to meet with demand that people are asking for, or, you know, are, are there things that people are not sure about that we should be putting into the courses? Yeah, I think the next kind of step for us which we've known for a while is that people want real onset and onset experience yeah you know we are trying to emulate that as best we can in our teaching studios in our office and we get pretty close and you know with the amount of hands-on time that you get throughout the course um, as a starting point it's yep. a great foundation to go forward people are then asking at the end of those two weeks well where do I go now how do I get my first you know, right. my first bit of experience on a VP shoot, can you put me in touch with someone? And we, you know, we have a network, we do our best, people are asking us for our graduates of the academy. Yep. Um, but going forward, I think we would like to be able to collaborate with some studios, with some, um, you know, drama schools, yep. and things like that to create this, uh, you know, your first VP onset project yep. um, as something that we would offer at the academy so that you can get real production experience so that your you know your first real vp shoot in the industry is actually your second real vp shoot because you've already had a chance to do it yeah um you know we and we have that those connections already through some of the big drama schools in london are saying well you know our our actors they want to learn how to yeah. act in these volumes they want to learn what that's like and how they need to develop those skills yeah um so you know there is a way to collaborate for for that as well yeah i mean as close as we get i mean we're very lucky that uh, as a manufacturer moses also goes on set and does production so uh we've been doing strictly come dancing the last two seasons we're doing it again this year we're doing limitless with anton deck we're on a big film shoot in poland so all of that experience is getting fed back into the academy course and it actually dictates the direction of our products as well but as he says it's never the same as getting somebody who, you know, who, who's gone through the course onto a real set and getting that experience. So that's really important. But there are things that have come out of um, this last two years which are really important to teach. And you know, a lot of people, I think, in the beginning thought that you just built an LED volume and you threw in your actors and they could all be lit correctly and it was all going to come you know, good in the end. And the reality is that you need to do an awful lot more. Things like determining pixel pitch, determining you know, uh, external lighting, how that collaborates with the LED wall, 
determining workflows. What happens when you get a shot where the background doesn't look photorealistic? You, know, you can capture it in real time, but it's not the shot that you want because you know it's better, it can be better in post. What do you do then? Those workflows where you then shoot the talent against the green frustum and go off to post, and knowing how to do that and make it really smooth is really important because the truth is post isn't going anywhere and real-time visual effects needs post-production because you cannot capture every single shot in real time. It just isn't possible to do it. Um, so these are the techniques that even on top of virtual production, we're gonna, we are teaching now because these are really important. Because once you know that you need a post-production exit from a real-time LED volume, you can plan for it. And, and planning is the key thing with virtual production because if you get that right, you get all the savings. If you don't plan correctly, you're never going to see or realize those savings. And that's really important. Um, so Ravensbourne um, used to be one of the top three, or only three, that uh, did high-end TV. But now it's a plethora of these universities with um, LED volumes. You know, we talk about Sunderland just recently put mm -hmm. one in. Um, how do you differentiate? What do you do to bring students to Ravensbourne who would otherwise go to South Bank or you know, some other university? What is it that brings them in? Well, we did a bit of a sort of trial and error thing uh, with your help. Uh, so we used a projection-based virtual production yep. setup. And um, I think the draw really was that this was is almost doing a bit of research yeah. and finding, okay, so how is this going to work out? And that's what kind of drew the students in because um, we're collaborating and it, to a degree, it's not student-led, but to be fair, some of them, you know, they're quite quick. Yep. And so, and, and a lot of them have already have a really good background in, in game design and, and you know, uh, they can work with assets, yep. they, they understand as that aspect of it. So we found that, you know, this, this collaboration with students um, and sort of, you know, trying to chart the unknown and see, it's just, let's just see what happens yep. when we use the projection based system. And I think that's what really drew them in. Right. It's not just, okay, this is what we already know, we're just going to, you know, of course you can have another LED wall, it would be great, but part of the aspect that the reason why we wanted to use it was sustainability as well yeah all right and universities are afraid of constantly reinvesting so they're looking for well how long can we use this you know so i think that idea that you know the the students feel like they're helping us explore this uncharted territory yeah right so, it's good yeah. yeah and we need and actually that collaboration between universities and manufacturers is really powerful um truth be told star tracker our tracking system, probably the most used in the world, came from a university PhD student originally working with our CEO. So it's a very valuable um, collaboration. So um, David, you know, people come into your volume, they're not always using tracked Unreal Engine graphics, are they? They're using other techniques. Talk about some of those. Well, if the camera is static, you don't need to, to yeah, track the, one. <laughs> the camera. Um, but also if you're using 2D content, so um, plates which are yeah. captured on camera arrays or even stills. So we, we have a number of um, really amazing panoramic yeah. um, HDR stills that Just we load. explain how those are captured. What, what's the technique? Um, in the case of the stills, it, it's, uh, it's a single camera doing an HDR stack, but uh, you know, over the course of maybe a month, this, yep. the artist we have who provided that content, he, that's his whole yeah. world and job. Um, but most of the time it's moving content, it's driving plates. There's a couple of companies we use here in the UK, one called Driving Plates um, and one called Brownian Motion. And what they usually do is they build an array on a car rig, which compromises of, in some cases, up to nine yep. Alexa Minis or Mini LFs with um, the field of view calculated so they overlap just enough to yeah. perform a good stitch and then it's played back either as a stitched plate or a as a freely stitched plate so you can still make slight adjustments to the each of the camera viewports yeah. Yeah. Um, which can be very creative so although you're you're aiming for ultra realism and the, the reflection from that angle will be exactly where it would be in reality well, for you know, creative reasons, you might want to just shift it on or up or over a little bit. So we, we incorporate that type of flexibility into, yeah. the, into the productions. That's usually. Good. I, I was uh, in LA talking to a company called Fuse. Um, and these are the guys who built the stage that, uh, or helped build ILM stagecraft, which the Mandalorian was shot in. And um, I got a look at some of their brochures. And what's interesting is they have a whole range of shapes of LED um, volume. 
because it depends very much on what the content is you're trying to shoot. So you've got a, what is it, a 270 with back panels, I think? Or yeah, it's like similar. a 360. Why but did it, you go for that? Um, for cars. It's essentially right. for cars to give a full wraparound. Yep. That, that is the reason. Right. Mm. And yeah. you've got the ceiling in there. And the ceiling. So the ceiling is movable because, yeah. and it's also, it can be split into four independent sections. Yep. Um, it's again, it's creative flexibility. We, we wanted to produce an environment which wasn't just practical for a single production, but for as many variations of production as possible. So since opening about a year ago, um, we've had 20 productions, no two the same, yep. um, from car shoots to rooftop shoots to uh, keynote um, yeah. global conference talks from CEOs to music videos from Coldplay. So really the whole idea around the environment, the production environment, is flexibility and creativity, that you're, you're not limited to one aperture, to one specific type of shooting environment. Yeah. And that's the part of ARI which I work for, which is a solutions group, that's what we're doing. We're, we're designing and building bespoke production environments for industry, but for also education. And what we, specifically in education, what we saw a lot of the time were broadcast systems being used for film application, which is fine. But what we know is that when the students leave the university, they won't encounter half of that technology when they leave. So what we try to do is still using a lot of the similar technology, but more with a filmic flavor. Yeah. So instead of self-climbing stage bar hoist, which you find in theaters and broadcasts, we build self-climbing truss um, squares, which you would find more common in yep. a commercial shoot yep. or on a feature film. So taking what we know from the feature and dramatic world and really putting it in front of students. So again, it's building that confidence and that when they do leave, things are familiar, yeah. they don't feel shy, they feel a confidence that they wouldn't otherwise have. Yeah. And so we've been talking about the, you know, the operators that get trained at universities and then, you know, the, the academies that bring in both ex-students um, and also transform existing production people into virtual production people. But there's another sector of the market that's interesting and, that, and those are the people, the pioneers, the, um, the people who start companies that buy the volumes. And one of the education uh, lessons they need to learn is, what are they gonna invest in? What are they gonna rent in? And what are they gonna buy? And if they build a volume, what shape are they gonna build such that it accommodates the widest spread of work? So for example, one of our clients, Diamond View, who are building these um, volumes all over the world, um, they have uh, in Vegas, just after NEB, launched uh, a J-shaped volume, why? because it allowed them to do the most kind of work they wanted to do and actually have corporate events in there. So it's about occupancy levels. Everybody wants to do movies and high-end TV drama, but actually you need to pay the bills. Yeah. Yeah. And these pioneers and innovators of volumes need to understand you know, what they're gonna build, where they're gonna spend their money, where they're gonna hire. Utilization. And, and utilization is yeah. the most important thing, yeah. So Don, that's probably another thing we need to add into our, our courses, you know, what would you buy? Why would you buy it? What sort of work can you cover? I think that's yeah. important too, because you are going to get, I mean, we've had Netflix and AWS on the course, right? Yeah. I mean, we, we have a lot of people who are already asking those kinds of questions. Yeah. You know, we have people who come specifically to the course to understand, you know, what am I going to buy for my university or for my small production company? They're going, you know, yeah. having a look at our equipment and what's actually required. And, you know, what you're saying is only just kind of a couple more steps down that line. It's, it's it's, you know, come there and try it out for yourself for two weeks, realize what you do and don't need. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you can go away with a bit, bit of a clearer shopping list. Yeah. And I think, so we, if we are educating the people correctly, we will fill that skills gap. We will get to a point where, you know, we're producing enough people to go in the market and actually enable these opportunities that we have to sell people equipment to actually move ahead with a team that works. Um, but what about cross-training people, do we find, this is for you, Domri, do we find people we bring in from existing production backgrounds, you know, ready, willing, able to transfer the skill set into or learn the virtual production skill set? Is, is that an easy transition or do we need to do more? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, it, it kind of, most people who are coming to the academy already have a will to yeah. do that. We do have a few people who kind of get sent by companies and they're kind of <laughs> looking, true, yeah. oh yeah, you know, I don't want to, yeah. really want to click around on the computer. But um, 
you know, it's not all about learning how to model in Unreal Engine. You don't have to be, you know, making code nodes and, and all that kind of very deep technical stuff to be able to utilize VP. And I think a lot of people realize that it can be quite a creative process yep. and they kind of soften up to it after they've kind of done it for a, for a couple of days, got their hands on it, and you know by the end of the course, everybody's loving it and, yeah. and, and kind of looking to get further involved. So. That's good. I think one of the, skill, or one of the challenges uh, is with, with DPs, with cinematographers, because we're, we're landing in their world of color and lights and framing, and we need to be really careful that we bring them with us. And you know the most established DPs are older, but they're less willing to learn new things. So we have to get that transition right between educating the young people who are keen, but actually wouldn't get the high-end jobs, which then doesn't promote virtual production, with training the, the older guys who've got all the experience, they are the name DPs, and getting that mix right in order to get this thing off the ground. So I think probably encompassing the you know, the um, guilds and the societies and going in there and teaching more of these techniques is really important. We're certainly members of, of many of them, but I think we could probably do, do even better. Um, do you have any uh, Ravensbourne connections with, you know, the, the various camera and technician societies in this country, or do you uh, we leave do. that to us, the manufacturers? Um, we, we do um, to a degree, but um, I, I know what you mean in that... Uh, uh, I personally see it as a, as a good challenge, having you know to think about lighting, on the virtual stage, um, and actually being limited, for instance, to what lens I can use. Yeah. Sometimes even to what camera I can use, how I can move it, because um, I like to work with these challenges and find out myself, you know, what limits. So how do, yeah. yeah. How, yeah. how does yeah. that work? But um, yeah, again, it's it's tricky because there's there is some resistance, and to be fair, even even from some students. Uh, th uh, the younger they are, the more so they're still trying to wrap their heads around traditional filmmaking. Yeah, they are, yeah. So they, they like the sets and they like, you know, stuff that is hands on. Um, so there must be some, there's, there's some kind of uh, gap in there between you, you might be too old, you might be too young, but somewhere in there, there's like the, the perfect target audience for this that has, you know, enough capacity to really get into it and not feel like you're, um, you're holding them back creatively. Correct. Which I don't think that's, that's actually true. Yeah. It's, there's a huge a, aversion to change. Uh, you, you just look at when, when, when Apple introduced Final Cut X or 10, everyone's like, no, 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 right? And that was a simple thing in a way. Um, so a lot of people are like, no, I, I, I like the way things have been, you know, the yep. traditional way yep. of, of... Resistance to change. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and that's, uh, obviously, we tr I try to incorporate that into the teaching in that we say, look, uh, going forward, we uh, we might have several careers in our lifetimes. You know, no one's probably going to do the same thing no. all their lives, right? And in in our industry, it means you you have to educate yourself, re-educate yourself, learn more about this and that. You right? do, yeah. yeah. One of the other uh, groups that's really important uh, to think about is the VFX post production environment, because on the surface, it seems like virtual production takes work away from them. Um, but actually, it doesn't. It actually works in, in collusion with them. It needs them. And if the, I think if the post companies get their heads around this and get this right, actually, they will become the providers of the assets that virtual production needs at the beginning. Because virtual production is all about preparation. You know, you arrive at the set where everything is final quality, ready to shoot, if, if, if you've organized it properly. And, and the, v, and the uh, VFX companies could well be those companies in the future that are creating all these assets. But again, they need education. Um, you know, we're trying, as most is, to engage more with them. But I think engaging with people like, you know, the VFX Society or the v, VS uh, FX Guide and bringing those guys in and, and working with them rather than being seen to work against them is really important. So do you... Do you David, at the ARRI volume, do you get involved with the, the VFX company? Yeah, we're, we're really closely working with yep. the VFX houses. So like, you know, DNEG, ILM, Framestore, yep. because it is a collaborative process. And, you know, they're not excluded. They are so much more part of it. Yeah. And in fact, their contribution happens so much earlier. Yep. And I see a world where, especially with, you know, there's a difference between post and VFX. VFX is creating the content, but the post has to assemble and finalize everything. It just means it's happening slightly, you know, more upfront, yeah. which is great because I, I see the post house actually sitting in production on yeah. the shoot, Correct. grading yeah. live yeah. and doing the assembly and doing the finals 
all at the same time. Yeah. I mean, there will always be traditional, you know, we'll, we'll fix it in post sort of mentality, but it will become less acceptable and less normalized as people find a way to, to, to make those creative decisions yeah. at the time of filming. I mean, for DPs, they love it because it's usually in the post where they're excluded. Yeah. And the post is usually excluded in the pre. Yeah. So if we can bring everyone together in the same, like throughout the entire journey together, I think it will make for better storytelling and yep. better quality and crafted images. I think you're right. I think you mentioned DPs, another really important one. Um, if you go into any color grading suite in the world, they adhere to standards. The projectors they use are set up to certain standards. They use aces uh, or, or don't um, for ensuring that colors that they actually put into content uh, are actually reproduced in the DCP deliverable. Um, that's great, and it's been well defined for, for many, many years. In virtual production, the color pipeline is not defined by any standard. So you've got people doing what they think is the right thing for them, but there's no real standard. So standards is, is one thing I think that needs to come into virtual production. And again, this needs to be taught. You know, when you go into a volume, how do you know that that wall is set up correctly? What do you meter off? What do you put on your, you know, your plates to VFX? such that they can you know, work out what they have to do. This is not defined, so I think the standard needs to be built in. Have you guys come across, are you being asked to teach standards, or is this something that's still, I guess it's still being sorted out by us, <laughs> the manufacturers and the, and the volume providers? Um, I mean, how do you do this, though? What, what, what so do you do? We, we have to find a workflow. So we, because Ari Did I set you up for that one? I, uh, I like, think yeah. so. I feel like it because um, we've, we've been working really hard on this topic because yeah. what we're seeing is a lot of bad examples yeah. of virtual production in the, mm -hmm. in, the, in the field out there. And there's a real detachment from background to foreground. Yes. And because we're quite uh, detailed about the topic of color at Ari, like uh, color is one of our really you know strong suits and yep. the new camera has a brand new color science to it. But what we realize is we have the perfect calibration device already in front of us. The camera um, will determine how the foreground image looks. Mm. And what we can do is we can use the camera to record a number of swatches which we play back in the video wall. We take the direct off-sensor readings to produce yep. an, a matrix, which yep. we then apply to the content yep. and Unreal. We turn everything off, all the post-processing off, the processes yep. from Unreal, from everywhere, and we apply the offset to the content, which forces the content to adopt the visual properties of what the camera sees in the foreground. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, and that and that calibrated pipeline is so important. So important because it means you, you you have predictable results. You're not going to have surprises at the end of the day. Which and is and really this important. has been a big problem. You've, there's been huge yeah. failures in what virtual production has promised because you're getting your footage, the background and foreground don't match. You're into a incredibly expensive post process now you are. of trying to rectify and fix something which was promised to you as in-camera final and, and it's interesting without giving all the details <laughs> away that if you read the stories that were released by epic and uh disney about the mandalorian how it was done and actually knowing the what reality, happened it's, yeah. it was a lot of this that they you know they went in with one idea and actually had to adapt during the shoot um to come out with the product they actually came out which was excellent but boy that must have cost a lot it's of money a lot of work yeah. but we you know we all understand what this what it does represent in efficiency yeah. and in in creative flexibility yep. like it, it's important that we do carry on down this road but it's down to manufacturers down to universities down to vfx vendors to come up with standards and solutions which which fix the critical points of the workflow and the pipeline yeah. in order to really deliver on the promise of what this is and this this is our biggest concern is that virtual production it's not going anywhere but you can sense there's been a little bit of a dip in the last two years in the people have made mistakes and you know rather than blaming maybe themselves um, they're blaming virtual production and that actually isn't where the problem lies the problem lies in things like knowing workflows understanding calibration cycles, Half knowledge which needs to be taught <laughs> which comes right back to the universities and the academies and feeding all that information back in and that's why i think we have a very good relationship with the raisins board i think we're on the advisory board aren't we where well, we're feeding in what we think the industry needs mm. and you're feeding back to us what the you know what the kids are saying that they need in order to get into the market and and, and build a, a career and that's really really important yeah um good I, i've kind of run out of things to talk about i hope giving you sort of a broad spectrum of 
this training requirement and uh, why it's so important and the complexities of it. It's not straightforward. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, basically, so the, uh, I guess the, the summary here is, is the training requirement is vast, it's growing, and it isn't just about learning the Unreal Engine. It's learning all these different things that we talked about. Um, and that's going to take some time, but we're, we're on the right path, which is good. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yes. And thanks for listening.